Tiny gaming PCs the size of my hand don't have to be expensive if you know what you're doing. Last month I made a YouTube short about this little travel PC, but I saw a lot of you wanted a budget version. So I built another version inside the same case and this time it came out to be less than $600. Even despite the size, that's honestly pretty impressive considering we're getting over 100 FPS in Battlefield 6 and Helldivers 2 so we could continue spreading some democracy. Today I'm gonna show you exactly how to do this for yourself even while the these RAM prices are sky high right now. We also have a dedicated benchmarking video, a full cheat sheet with the juicy details, and a step-by-step -step building video so you have everything that you need to copy. And real quickly, my name is Zach and I'm just here to help you jump into PC gaming or PC building. I have free PC building resources on my website, including build guide templates, I sell pre-builds on zttbuilds.com, and I make a ton of videos just like this. I'm just here to show you all of the options, like this one, which is pretty fun. What I do want to take advantage of real quickly though is today's video sponsor, the Corsair Frame 4500X. This beautiful case combines the modern fishbowl design of the 3500X with the modularity of the Frame series cases. For aesthetics, it's rocking that curved front glass panel and also a cascading waterfall design on the top and bottom. On the modularity side, it has that Infini Rail fan mounting system and also the Frame modular system. It's the best of both worlds and if you want to check it out for yourself, that's linked down in the description. Alright, so before we wrap off the parts list, we gotta talk about the downside of small form factor builds like this, pricing. That ITX tax is very real. When people say ITX tax, they're usually referring to three components being overly expensive, but that actually doesn't affect us much in today's build. The first ITX tax is typically placed on the case, and that's because some of these tiny little contraptions have a ton of engineering packed into a small form factor. On the flip side, there's also some budget alternatives, and this one is a perfect example. I honestly don't even know what the actual model name is called, but it's from Joyjom over on Amazon and it only costs $76. Now compared to budget micro ATX options, that's still $15 to $20 more and cases like the Okinos Air also come with fans, but for a case the size of my hand with this kind of compatibility, it isn't all that bad. This is a spine design, so the motherboard goes on one side and the GPU on the other. It can only hold a single fan graphics card, but it can be two slots in width, which opens up our options a bit. Remember that for tiny GPUs, there's three different types of tiny GPUs. There's low profile like the Gigabyte RTX 4060 and 5060. Those are half height so they can fit in one use server racks or other types of small form factor cases. The problem is that they have three fans so the length is way too long for a case like this. There's also single slot GPUs which you could put in a crammed office OEM PC and those options are extremely limited as well. That's why I love that this Joyjom actually allows for a two slot GPU but just barely. And finally the last type of smaller GPU are the single fan or sometimes called ITX. This limits the length of the GPU and that's definitely required because this case can only hold GPUs up to 170 millimeters long. You can even see when I put the GPU on top of the case, that's all the room that we're gonna get. Now, how does this GPU plug in on the backside of the motherboard? A PCIe riser cable and that's another feature of this Joyjom case. It comes included with one and that allows you to essentially extend the connection of your GPU to the backside of the case. I love that it comes included but keep in mind that this is only a PCIe 3.0 riser. Some GPUs these days are bottlenecked by the PCIe generation, so if you're gonna copy this at home, I would do research to see how your GPU performs at PCIe Gen 3. Sometimes it's a big deal and sometimes it's not. That also went into why I chose this specific GPU, but we'll talk about that in just a bit. The second part that usually gets hit with the ITX tax is the power supply, and that's because for a lot of small form factor builds, you need an SFF or SFX form factor. These are tiny and it's actually crazy the first time you pick one of them up compared to a beefy ATX unit. But this Joyjom case actually requires a PSU even smaller than SFX. This is called a flex power supply and specifically it's the Apivia ITX PFC 500 watt model. I've personally used this in several tiny builds already and my buddy ETA Prime uses the same one for many of his projects as well. We've both never had an issue with it but it's not exactly gonna have a high tier rating but unfortunately it's really the only option. Flex PSUs skyrocket in price so the only real option 
under 100 or sometimes even 150 are these Apivias. Personally, if this is something that's gonna worry you, I wouldn't actually recommend putting like a $150 power supply inside a build like this that's just gonna eat up way too much of your budget. Your next best alternative would be a completely different case at that point. Personally, I'd rather just go with this Apivia for under 50 bucks because that's what makes sense for a budget build like this. But yeah, going back to this flex design, this is for 1U height servers or tiny cases like this. And good thing it's modular because we have absolutely no room for extra cables. These Apivias work just fine and all the connectors on the component side of the cable are just like normal. All I had to plug in was the CPU power, 24 pin motherboard power, and that's it because even our GPU doesn't require an external connector. And finally, the last component that usually skyrockets in price because of ITX tax is the motherboard. But once again, we're actually not affected by that a whole lot. Of course, we're gonna stick with AM4 at this low of a price build. So this is the ASRock B550M ITX AC. This was simply the cheapest ITX AM4 motherboard that I could find. Bonus points because it has built-in Wi-Fi and the B550 platform is still one of the best, if not the very best option right now. At only $90, we're not overpaying for this a whole lot. In a micro ATX build, you can find some B550s for sometimes around $70 to $80, but honestly, that's getting more difficult to do, especially in this past year. So yeah, despite this build being literally the size of my hand, we're not actually falling for the ITX tax a whole lot, and that's gonna open up some serious price to performance value. We'll benchmark it here in just a second, but let's run through the rest of the parts list so we see what we're working with. For the AM4 based build, I decided on the Ryzen 5 5500, and that's because it was on an outrageous deal over on Amazon for only $50. I'll admit, you have an extremely low chance of ever getting a 5500 at that kind of deal ever again. Not sure what was going on there, but even without a deal, this is still about a $600 gaming PC. The 5500 usually sits around $70, and even at that price, it's still one of the best possible options for cheaper builds like this. It's got good price to performance even in the CPU demanding games, and there's a bit of a room to upgrade with the 5600X, 5700X, or maybe even an X3D if you wanted to. Side note, this is why I wouldn't even consider an Intel CPU for this type of build. Sure, there's some models like the 12400F which would be great here, but the upgrade path to an i7 13th or 14th gen isn't what I wanna deal with, and keeping those types of CPUs cool in a build like this would be next to an impossible task. The 5500 also allows us to slightly avoid RAM again in prices because DDR4 isn't nearly as bad as DDR5 right now, at least not yet. This is the Clevbolt X 16 gigabyte DDR4 kit clocked at 3600 megahertz with a CL18 rating. Now, I definitely would have preferred to go with a 32 gigabyte kit like normal, but that is unfortunately the consequences of RAM again right now because I paid $54 just for 16 gigs. If you're not on a super strict budget and trying to stay under $600 like I was, then this is absolutely where I would spend the extra money first. 16 gigabytes will still allow us to run every game, but it's definitely the weak point in terms of performance for this system. Next up, we have the SSD, and pricing for these still isn't completely terrible. It's a bit higher than what it was a couple months ago, but it's not too bad, and I'm hoping it holds strong here. This is a PMY CS2241 one terabyte NVMe. It's a cheaper Gen 4 drive, and that's all we need for a build like this. If you think you'll need more storage in the future, though, now would be a good time to spend the extra money. One of the downfalls of some ITX motherboards, especially the budget ones is that you'll only get a single M.2 slot. In a bigger motherboard, you'd be able to just add a secondary SSD for more storage and not lose your Windows installation. But when you only have one slot and you wanna upgrade your storage, you'll have to completely replace it. So keep that in mind. The final thing on this motherboard we have is the Thermalrite AXP90 X36 CPU cooler. If you're subscribed to the ZTT Extras channel and watch those shorts or my live streams over on Twitch, you'll know all about this one already. This Joyjom case only allows for CPU coolers up to 36 millimeters in height and that's exactly the height of this thermal right. There's honestly not a ton of options for this short of a cooler, I think less than five total, but I'm pretty sure this is one of the best models. The only problem with it is that the installation process is so old school, and even after reading the instructions and watching thermal right's video, I was thrown for a loop. They actually want you to place the motherboard upside down on top of the CPU cooler. This feels so wrong, especially with thermal paste on the CPU, and I didn't enjoy a single second of it. There are other ways to do it, but this one is honestly the easiest. Trust me, I tried. You can tell that the CPU cooler has been out for a while because most other cooler manufacturers have figured out a much easier way to install them these days. It's not a huge deal because you only have to hopefully do this one single time, but definitely something to keep in mind. And finally, the only other part that we have inside of here is of course the GPU. And I don't know how this keeps happening in back-to-back -back videos, but we are yet again gonna feature an RTX 3050. Remember that we are extremely limited with options that are only a single fan design. There are some better options these days like the RTX 5050 and Zotac even makes a 5060, but those are way more expensive and that would result in like a seven or $800 build. To keep the cost down as low as possible,
possible and without sacrificing crazy performance, the 3050 is the best option for this price range. It only has six gigabytes of VRAM, which does kind of suck. But honestly, like I said in our recent two GPU video, the 3050 isn't actually all that terrible. The price to performance compared to other options is terrible. But for a build like this being very tiny and at an affordable price range, I'm honestly kind of impressed with these benchmarks. Before we get into that though, here's what the full parts this is looking like. And like I said earlier, if you don't find the CPU deal like I did, you're gonna end up right around $600. Hopefully RAM doesn't go a whole lot higher, but other than that, this build really isn't difficult to replicate at all. If you don't find something in stock, then feel free to reference the cheat sheet, which is also linked down in the description. I also threw in some extra information if you're copying this build, such as a cable management guide, the BIOS settings we use, and even monitor recommendations. It's all totally for free, enjoy. But now it's time for the benchmarks. And the first test we ran was obviously Battlefield 6. I've been enjoying this one more than any other shooter release of the past few years. And in 1080p with low settings, we got 107 FPS. That is of course with FSR set to ultra performance though, because even though this is an optimized title, it's still a good looking game and a 3050 will need a little bit of help. Next up, we have Borderlands 4. And this one, as we all know, is incredibly unoptimized. Despite that, we actually got a pretty solid 71 FPS. But again, that was with 1080p low with FSR set to quality. And we even needed a bit of frame gen to make that possible. For Borders Gate 3 in 1080p low, I got 71 FPS. Helldivers 2 in 1080p low with DLSS got 104 FPS. And here's Fortnite in 1080p pro with performance mode. And that got a pretty solid 160 average FPS. Here are the rest of the games that we tested. And if you want to see the full dedicated benchmarking video with way longer gameplay clips, we just uploaded that to the ZTT Extras channel. We're trying to hit 100K subs by the end of the year over there. So if you want more ZTT content, that's the place to be. Now, real quickly, let's talk about cooling because that can definitely be another potential downfall with these small form factor builds. To my surprise, I actually didn't even have to tweak anything in the BIOS like I thought I would. For that other travel PC, I resorted to undervolting the Ryzen 5 9600X and setting a temperature max in the BIOS. But for this little 5500, none of that was necessary. Here you can see a Monster Hunter Wilds where the CPU is getting up there in 50 to 60% utilization. It's still hanging out in the 70 degree range. The GPU is even a touch cooler than that while it's being pumped to 100% the entire time. I actually really like how this tiny PC turned out, but if you wanna see how else you could spend this kind of money on a slightly bigger build so you don't have the ITX drawbacks, that video is up on the screen right now.